I, I don't call it a job, I don't know what it is, this enterprise, this vocation, this calling, because sometimes in a way you, you don't choose it, you can't help yourself, right? Because let's face it, I know everybody thinks it's glamorous and some people actually think it's fun. It's neither one of those things in my opinion. Welcome back to The Kevin Roberts Show. You know, we often, perhaps most often, record this show inside the Heritage Foundation, but it's always a treat when we're able to come over to the house side of the Capitol Hill and visit with a man or a woman who's making a difference. And I am happy to be here with someone you probably know. You've probably seen Congressman Scott Perry, the chairman of the House Freedom Caucus from the great state of Pennsylvania, because he is fearless when it comes to every public policy issue. This is why We've become friends, and he's also a longtime friend of Heritage. Scott Perry, thanks for making time. Well, I am honored, and uh, I'm thrilled to be on the Dr. <laughs> President Kevin Roberts show. It's I'm, awesome. You know, a military guy would get his titles right. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for that. Brigadier we, General Scott Perry. You which one to, are we selecting today for you? Uh, Kevin. Kevin. Just all right. All right. Yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. I'll tell you what my wife says when I jokingly say, you know, Michelle, you need to refer to me as Dr. Roberts. Can't repeat that inside the office yeah, of the Congress. Yeah. You, you know the drill. Right. I, We're going to get to some serious stuff, yeah. Scott. And and all kidding and, and sarcasm aside, um, it, it's important to cover with you. You're, you're a humble guy, a servant of this country. But you're also a guy, in spite of that humility, who has a lot of wisdom about what needs to happen. And so for our audience, that's where we're going. But I gave you the cue a few minutes ago. We're going to talk a little bit about your story. I thought I'd gotten to know you some. In my, in my two years at Heritage, and I didn't know until today that you're the son of Colombian immigrants. Yeah, my mother's Colombian. I don't know my father. Okay. And, um, and I think about that, and it was a choice that I made um, very, um, I guess, directly. I was a state representative. Mm. This seat opened up, and I didn't ever, I never expected to be a state representative. I never expected to run for anything. And um, we had a little baby, and I, we just had another little baby. And I was building a house. I was finishing a master's degree, and we were living in this little place with our youngest daughter in the bedroom with us at night. So, you know, you, nobody gets any sleep. And I remember it was my turn to get up that at night at 2 or 3 in the morning and feed her. And I, it was right in the middle of a couple days of making this decision, whether I was going to run for Congress or not. I hadn't ever contemplated anything like this. And I was holding this little baby, and the light's very dim, you know, it's the middle of the night, and you night light on, and I'm thinking, I, I wanna be here for my, for my child. I don't know my father, and I'm not gonna have that for my children. But I also want this country to be here for my kid. <sighs> That's tough, right? How do you wrestle with that? Yeah, yeah, because this, this I, I don't call it a job. I don't know what it is. This enterprise, this vocation, this calling. Because sometimes in a way you, you don't choose it. You can't help yourself, right? Because let's face it, I know everybody thinks it's glamorous. And some people actually think it's fun. It's neither one of those things, in my opinion. But you get called to it. Um, it takes you away from your family. And, um, and I'm not complaining. I made the choice. But just like a lot of other things, whether you're a truck driver or a member of Congress, you're making decisions, you're making choices, we all make decisions. You're not gonna be there for cross country meets, you're not gonna be there for the play, you're not gonna be, you're not gonna be there for your wedding anniversary. You're just not gonna be there. There's, you know, and believe it or not, like children and spouses don't love all that. They don't love it. They're, they're humans. Yeah. And, and, and they would like you home. Yeah. yeah. You, didn't, you didn't say all of that for this comment, but thank you. And, and I often, when I'm actually, hopefully every time I'm here with members of the House or Senate, regardless of what we're talking about, whether there's 100% alignment like there is between you and me or 80 or whatever, I always say thank you because of what you just said. And I think for people in this audience, whether they're watching or listening to hear that is really important. I know they don't hear a complaint in there. They just hear no, no complaints. A, a, a real heavy dose of reality, right? And that's always been true about people who are serving in Congress, but it's particularly true right now when mostly figuratively, but in some cases, literally the country's on fire and the world's going to hell in a handbasket. Yeah. And, and we're gonna get into the policy aspects of that, but another really important part of your biography that's important for the audience to know is, is that you're a 40 plus year veteran of the armed services, a helicopter pilot. Do I, yeah. remember I got, that I got to, uh, the being in the military was a great 
privilege to me, and it, 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 it taught me a lot, it offered me a lot, and I got to do things that people only dream of, believe it or not, and it really is true, and I got to fly almost every single rotary wing helicopter, rotary wing aircraft in the Army inventory over 38 and a half years uh, in the military, and I miss flying, um, but uh, you know I'm on to something else now, but uh, it, I, I don't have anything but, uh, but praise for what the military can offer young people, or maybe better put, and I sadly say this, the military I joined. Why do you say that? Military has changed, and at the end of my career, I went to my boss and said, it's time for me to go. And he said, well, we're not ready for you to go yet. And I said, I'm going. When you belong to a business, a family, an organization like the military, you reflect it, but it also reflects you. And unfortunately, I got in when I was 18, and that 38 and a half years later, it didn't reflect a lot of the values that I showed up with. Do you think there's still time for members of Congress to effect change, to get the military as it is now back to like the military that you joined? Of course, I wouldn't be here if I didn't think we couldn't solve these problems. But I would say that if you think we're going to solve them in one election cycle for Congress, two years, or one presidential cycle, unfortunately, that's not, that's, I don't think that's really possible. There's, this is now a long road to get to where we need to be. So in, in there is, is a heavy dose of reality that even if we win, you know, conservatives win in 2024, and we all pat ourselves on the back, you're saying, no, we need to be really persistent for many years, right? <laughs> Yeah, we've got, uh, we have to have a long winning streak and we have to have a view towards the kind of the long goals, the long-term goals, work towards them. But if we think that we're going to solve this nation's and this world's problems in, in one election cycle, whether it's a congressional, a Senate, or a presidential one, I, I think we're missing the mark here. We've got a lot of work to do. And it's years and decades of neglect. You, if you neglect your family and your relationship with your spouse or your business and, and operating it, things are going to decay. And we have neglected them. That's just the a sad truth. Not every person... Not every day, but collectively, we have neglected our wonderful country, and this is what you get when you neglect it. So over your, your tenure here in Congress, you've been here 10, 11 years? Yeah, 10 years. It's yeah. amazing. And you're still a young guy. I wish I were young. You're the young guy here. Oh, I don't know about that. But over that time, what changed the most in the chamber? <laughs> I've seen some changes, but they've been dramatic in the last uh, in the last nine months or so. Um, not a lot changed in the for the most of the time I've been here. We changed a couple people around, but the operation stayed generally the same. And you see things over time, but this place is really spring. It's default setting. It's spring loaded to go back exactly to non-confrontational. Washington, D.C. runs this. When I say Washington, D.C., I'm not talking about members, but there's a certain amount of that. But this institution and everything around it, and, and I, I think the difference is, is that there's this, this feeling, this, uh, this perception that the American people are running Washington, D.C. They're not. That's the problem. And so the biggest changes I have seen have occurred um, mostly this year, but there was other ones. I mean, it started really, it started with the Freedom Caucus for me. And, and I was, you know, I became a member of what I think called the Republican Study Committee, but I realized pretty quickly it, w it w wasn't gonna do anything. Um, and that's because it was taken over by this town, right? It originally started out to do something, but it was taken over by the town. So the Freedom Caucus started, but it was the voting against your own leadership, like really voting against them. And then the departure of Speaker Boehner, not, not because he decided he, to hang it up. We kind of, you know. Helped him. We helped him out. You know, it was just his time to go. And that started this realization that the voice of the American people through their representatives can, can be heard here. It comes at a huge cost. It's incredibly difficult. It's really uncomfortable, um, but it can happen if you're committed to it. And, and so 
we've been informed over that period of time. And, and like you said, I've been here now for a little while and longer than I'm when I started out that I thought I would be. I don't really know if I thought I'd be here for 10 years, but um, it's taken this amount of time to get to the point where some of these foundational changes could actually take place. Was there, on that point, was there an issue when you were sitting down years ago weighing, spending more time at home or running for Congress, was there a policy issue that you that really motivated you to, to come into Congress? I think I was like most Americans that watch the news in the evening. You say a policy issue. No, There's the world was on fire. You're like, how can this be so screwed up? Can't anybody do anything? Won't anybody do anything? <clears throat> and and then, you, like I said, this window of opportunity opened up. The good Lord, you know, you, you think, is this a blessing or a curse? I'm not sure. But um, you think that maybe you're the person that can make the change. And I think every member that comes here th believes that. I, I, I think that's true. Um, but no, it was just the the... the, the combination of everything that seemed like it was going the wrong way. And you said, well, nobody ever says what I think, so why don't I go say what I think? Because I know a bunch of other people here that think the same thing. So if you had your way today, as we yeah. sit here, it's late 2023, and we're spending way too much money. We don't have any strategic clarity about Ukraine as, as much as we want them to win. Uh, obviously, Israel under assault, which is a way of assaulting Western civilization. Yes. Concerns, which I know you share with us at Heritage about China's saber rattling right. toward Taiwan, but really toward the rest of the world. If I gave you a magic wand mm. and, and you could wave it, say, two or three times. I mean, this really is magic wand thinking, which I know we're not accustomed to. I just get two or three times. This is like genie in the bottle I, thing. And, that, and you right. can't wish for another three wishes on your. That's right. it, it, it's two or three okay. for you to say, this is how we fix it. Does that my magic wand include things that the legislature can't fix? Like we can't fix culture, right? It's we a can't magic wand. Okay, so and I love where you're going with that. If I could, yeah, if I could, I think all the other problems, spending, China, and wanting to take over the world and the and the the wars around the country or around the world and our involvement in them all those things are solved with a with a citizenry with a population that understands what their place is not only in their personal life which is important like get up get up out of bed in the morning make your bed get dressed and go to work with a good attitude, whatever your work is. And I clean, I worked in sewers. I've done a lot of different things. Be the best at it and smile through it and get after it, right? That's just, so I think changing, so that, that would be number one is just changing America to understand what their place is and what this government is about and what it's not about. It's not about fixing all your problems. We just had arguments on the floor today and my good colleague from the other side of the aisle said, you know, oh, you're out there on your own. I, I can't tell whether I'm pumping gas or diesel. I depend on the government to do that. And he's just he's just using that as an example. Well, I pump gas. That's what I did at Raise Exxon, right? I did that, among other things. I know gas from diesel, from kerosene. And if I don't, maybe that's something I should know. I don't need the government. Like, they act like we can't do anything without the government. So if I could change anything, I would, I would change... I don't know what the right time frame was, but it seems to me that somewhere I missed the greatest generation. I should have been born. At, that's what people understood their place in the world and in their family and in their community and in their country. If I could, that would be number one, I think. And if I could do number one, number two, three, and they would all happen because they would say, well, this is crazy. Why are any of us doing this? We We wouldn't argue about are you a man or a woman? And should your daughter be showering with my son in the school? Like, we wouldn't even have that discussion, right? Because because we know what that is. We we don't. Have, that's no longer a point of interest. We can get we can deal with things that are real. So, in other words, if as most of us, at least on the political right, want we want the government out of the way. The best way for us to do that, to effect that change, is to attend to our own, not just personal responsibility, but 
but obligations. I mean, the, the, to to our family members, to our friends, to our communities, and and to kind of pull ourselves up from our bootstraps and yeah, and, really, and lend a hand without government saying you ought to go lend a hand. Yeah, you just do that because it's the right thing to do. And I'm not saying the world was perfect back then. Like I said, my. Uh, yeah, uh, my father, I guess, is probably somewhere just after the greatest generation. I don't know him, but obviously it didn't work out so well. And he kind of abandoned me and my brother as little kids, and I don't know him. And that's not perfect. I'm not saying the world was perfect, but I think that generally speaking, America as a culture, as, as a population, as a people, understood what was right and what was wrong in the world and what, was, what made America the greatest country on the planet. And and if we could just reinvigorate that and reinstill that and recreate that, if that could be recreated, not that we can recreate it, but, um, you know, that revival of sorts and the other revival as well, which, which really, um, I, I think, feeds into, it really informs the citizen revival, but the revival of believing in something someone bigger than yourself, a creator that has all this figured out, right? Each of those is a crisis, right? right. And, and it's, I'm really grateful that you put your own work as a, as a member of Congress in, in such great perspective. And, and for what it's worth, that, I think that's the greatest answer to the magic wand question I've ever got. <laughs> it's so real. It's also the best way to use the magic wand, which is to, is to change culture and to get Americans back to what Americans were doing for so many years up until like 20 or 25 years ago. And what I also love about it is, and this is coming from the Heritage Foundation where our lane is public policy, right? right? right. That we tell people as much as we might have a little bit of influence on public policy, we would love to have even more influence on society and culture. That's absolutely, we can make all the laws that we want to here. Let's just say everything works out and the way I want it to. And we pass all these bills and then they become law. The president signs them for whatever. He just has an epiphany and says, oh my, you know, I'm going to do what the good Lord wants to do here and I'm going to sign it. It's not going to change people's viewpoints of about what's important to them culturally. And if, if, if marriage is irrelevant to them, it's, you can throw that away. If family can be thrown away, if you can abandon your children, if you can abandon your responsibilities, if you don't care to, to do better for yourself, which does better for your community, to clean up your own home and your own neighborhood. If you're, it, we can't make you do that. that come, that's innate. That comes from human nature, but it's also learned. If we, if we learn to accept those things and, and, and start accepting them, they become acceptable. So let's go from the really important, what you've just been talking about, to uh, <laughs> the important but uh, sometimes mundane, although this year the exciting, and that is legislative priorities in the House right, of Representatives. Right. The most common question I've gotten as I traveled the country the last few months from heritage friends is, what does Congress need to do to get back on track? Oh my goodness. That's a really big question. It, it is. But as the chairman of the Freedom Caucus, I know that, I mean, I know firsthand you've thought yeah. about this, you speak about it. What, what are some steps that need to happen if, if you and your colleagues in the Freedom Caucus have your way? Some steps are pretty- the Legislative yeah, steps. Pretty but big steps, but pretty simple. Pass a budget. This is how much money we're gonna spend this year of yours. This is how much, and in the context of how much we're, you know, don't, how much money we're, we're taking in five trillion, we're spending 7.2, so that's a problem because we we don't have pass a budget. We don't even no one knows, no one cares. Pass a budget that we actually care about that that we can achieve, and then pass these 12 separate spending bills so that you can see how I voted on this piece of legislation. So you can say, I don't know if you should be here anymore. You seem to maybe have lost your way, or look, you did a pretty good job here and get away from this, it's all piled in here at one time, and I can say, Kevin, I didn't want to vote for that, but I had to get this one thing that was important to the country, and so I had to vote for all of that or shut the government down, so what was my choice? And so you don't know whether, you know, I voted for this other terrible, that all has to end, that's the spending component. And then the other thing, as, as a macro thing, is, is that there's just a few people in this, operation that really run the show here. 
people have this illusion of representative government. Well, I voted for our guy and our gal and they're great people and they're up there or down there in Washington doing the hard work and they're in the meetings and they're getting these amendments and they're, sorry, sorry, that's not really how this goes, right? I mean, it's getting better, right? We didn't have an amendment on the floor for seven years. People say, well, who, what does that matter? If I'm not on a committee that's moving a, a piece of legislation that affects you, and I'm your representative, where's your voice? My only chance is to have an amendment. It's, it's going to fail, more than likely, but at least I get a voice, right? I always say, I don't have to have my way, but I gotta have a say on behalf of my constituents, my bosses. So, so structurally, and you're seeing some of that being broken now, the cartel, or you've seen some of that, Anybody can do these jobs. They're not rocket science. And I will tell you, the last guy we had running this place, Speaker of the House, third in line to the presidency, as best I could tell, his experience in the business world running an organization, and by the way, it seems to me this is, the federal government is one of the, if not the largest organization on the planet. He ran like a sandwich shop when he was a young man. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to disparage him, but, a lot of people can do these jobs. It's not just a couple, you know, th this isn't high school popularity contest. This is running the country. And we need all these voices and we need all these ideas. And I, I remember when I first went to the state house, I sat next to a gentleman, it was in my seat, and there was a bill on the floor. And he said, I'm not voting for that. that guy's a jerk. He didn't use the word jerk. He said something else. But I said, I think you're probably right. He is a jerk, but this is a good effort. This is a good, worthy cause here. He wouldn't vote for it, and I voted for it. I mean, but that it, attitude. It explains how things work or, or don't work yeah, sometimes, right? It's, it's not personal for me. It's business. It's the business of running the country. I might not agree with you. I might not even like you. Doesn't matter. If you're doing the right thing and the righteous thing, I should be for that. So one more policy question, and that is on foreign policy. Yeah. But at Heritage, we prefer to call national security because okay. it sort of puts the perspective in the right yeah, way. But you, sure. you, you describe it how you would like. <clears throat> but the, the question is, with all of these hot spots in the world, to say the least, how, how do you, as a member of Congress, as, a, as the chairman of the Freedom Caucus, and as a, as a veteran, figure out how to prioritize them? Mm. It would be nice if America could wield that, that military influence simultaneously we lament that we can't, that's our assessment at Heritage. We lament that we can't, but at the same time, I'm drawn to what George Washington said about foreign entanglements, right? And so, and I'm also, this thing about getting older, you, I don't know if you become wiser, but you seem to know more, you have more data points along the way, right? And I remember Desert Storm, I, you know, I was a, a, a reserve corps, I was a guard officer, pilot, but I wanted to go, so I, I signed up and volunteered, but they didn't take me, it didn't last long. The war was over, they didn't need any pilots, and that we won, and that was great. Um, but you come to find out that sometimes, you know, I trained to, for war, and you want to go ply your trade. You want to go see if it works and do it. Um, but you don't always have all the information and you're not sure all the information is accurate. So I'm much more circumspect about all of that right now. But at the same time, we got I think we have to be, we have to be mindful of the context. This isn't the 1940s anymore. This isn't the end of World War II. And there's a lot, technology has changed. Our position in the world has changed culturally. We can't get people, we can't recruit people for the armed forces and the ones that we, can recruit and do recruit, many of them cannot, they can't meet the standard. That's unfortunate to say, but it's reality. And if you're gonna fight to the death, we need a certain mindset and we need a certain capability. I'm not sure that capability exists. Um, financially, we simply can't afford to do all the things. We have to make these choices. Do we wanna pay for, a, I deal with public, trans, I'm on transportation and infrastructure committee. So one of the things is, all these public transit things. And I say to people, they lose money every year. They all lose money. And the problem is, is that somebody invented the airplane and the car. That, that's the problem. I mean, I'm not, say, I'm not mad at them. It's not that I dislike them. There are better options. And I'm not saying they should go away, but we simply don't have the money for them and this. So which choice are we going to make? 
And while things around the world are in their interest, how we afford to deal with them it makes a difference. So I don't want to get into a hot war with Iran, but at the same time, we could be we could be making sure Iran gets the message or Russia or China. China trades openly on our stock market, yet doesn't follow any of the rules of American companies. If we really want to say to China, hey, we don't appreciate your behavior, we don't want to get in a war with you, but we're not going to let you do this anymore because it helps you and it hurts us. Why, why is that, why, it why is be, that just a be so easy concept? Whether it's Iran, whether it's Russia, whether it's China, whether it's North Korea, we don't have to get in a shooting war to have the effect of letting the world know America's still here and we're just not putting up with certain things and, and we expect you to act right. But yet we won't do these things. Do you, do you think, just a quick follow-up, it, it seems to me just in, in the last several months that more of your colleagues in the House and in the Senate are arriving at that conclusion that in fact, basically what you just said, this, this realism, it's not weakness, quite the opposite actually, there's a lot of strength in what you said, in that realism that that's really where conservative national security needs to be moving forward. We, ha we have, everything, everybody has limitations, you have limited resources, whether it's time, whether it's every single resource you have, there's a limit to it and I think that whether it's the financial circumstances that we are in, or whether it's people are saying, well, I'm not sending my sons and daughters over to this, this war. What's, we don't even know what the mission is. Like, isn't that a reasonable question? We weren't attacked. I get it. When the, Jap when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor or when the terrorists attacked you know, New York City, Washington, D.C., and Shanksville, Pennsylvania, as it were, we understood we were at war. But Ukraine's at war. We want to help our friends there. We don't agree with Russia. We want to help our friends in Israel. We don't agree with Hamas and the terrorists. But there's a couple different ways to do that, and sending our blood and treasure there isn't the only way to do it and re achieve results. I, I think people realize that. So I'll ask you one final question because sure. uh, we're here in your office. I know you've, you've got to get on to your next meeting, and thanks for no, your time. No, it's actually that you're the guy that's the oh, important on one here. I'm come just, on, General I'm Scott one Perry. Of, you're one of one <laughs> in all of the world. I'm one of 435 here, so yeah. think about that. Yeah, you're very kind, you're very kind. It's still the last question though. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> this has been great. Hopefully we could do this many I'm times sure. over the years. <clears throat> but it, it's, it's a spin on the typical last question that I, I ask almost every guest, especially elected officials, and it's about oh. legitimate hopefulness. Yeah. Not the hollow optimism that we sometimes hear from elected officials, not Scott Perry, but the real reasons for hopefulness, and, and I know you travel the country and you go back, back home and you probably hear from your constituent, Scott, I wanna have hope in the country, yeah. but I'm, I'm pretty discouraged by what's going on. Yeah. How do you respond to Americans who, in their gut, wanna be hopeful about this great country, but what they see around them is not very hopeful? I'm hopeful because um, I see the, the people that get elected and come and join the Freedom Caucus. And I will tell you, when I came to Congress, it wasn't too long after. I remember we, we call it flying day. It's the day you come in for votes in the evening. I walk down to the House floor and you get a chill. You should get a chill. You're in the most important deliberative body on the planet. And I remember I was standing there. John Boehner was the speaker. We were doing nothing meaningful. And I thought to myself, I'm just wait, what am I doing here? I'm like wasting my time. What is happening? But this group was getting together called the Freedom Caucus, and we were pursued by our leadership. We were, we were literally hiding out in rooms, talking where they couldn't find us. And I thought, these guys and gals are like the, you know, the founding fathers that hid out in the taverns in the low light against the, the biggest military on the planet, the Great Britain, right? The colonialism and all around. And, they, and look what they did. And I see the same spirit in some of the folks that come here and they're nice and they're polite and they say, I'm not doing that. They're nice about it, they'll smile. I'm not doing that. And so it gives me hope because you need to, to me, you need to be competent when you need to be here. You need to have conviction when you come here. This is what's lacking most of the time. You need to have some courage when you come here. You put those three things together and I see them. Those folks are in the Freedom Caucus. I work around them all the time and I feel so small around them because they were so bright 
and so courageous and so committed to saving this republic. And that's what makes me hopeful because I see there's a path. Chairman Scott Perry, thanks for your time. Thanks for your own commitment, your own courage, your own patriotism, and your hopefulness. I am hopeful. Thank you. God bless Thank you, you Dr. <laughs> President Kevin Roberts. You got it. We'll do this again. Okay. All right. I told you you'd enjoy this episode. If you have not yet gotten to know Congressman Scott Perry, now you do. And you need to follow him in the Freedom Caucus. And just know that we're going to win some, we're going to lose some. But ultimately, we are going to take back this country because of what Scott said. Thanks for being part of this. Keep your chin up. We're going to win. The Kevin Roberts Show is brought to you by more than half a million members of the Heritage Foundation. The producer is Philip Reynolds. Sound designed by Lauren Evans, Mark Guiney, and Tim Kennedy. For more information and to subscribe, please visit heritage.org.